Okay, let me share my screen. I've actually never shared my screen on um, Zoom, so I gotta figure it out. One second. Looks like you figured it out real quick. Okay, that's good. Okay, so good morning. My name is Caitlin Pope, and today I'll be presenting my capstone project. My project is based on the plague of whitewashed American history and highlighting the untold legacy of um, Black experience and exceptionalism. So this is pretty much looking at American history books and how there's really not that much um, information on Black history. And then I'll reference that only thing that is really presented in American history books about Black history is just the generalization of slavery and also just the civil rights movement. So for background, I am saying that in present American history books, there's not that much information about Black history for the years between 1619 and 2020, really referencing 1619 because that's when slavery uh, started. And then up until really the 21st century, there hasn't been that much. Um, between the early 2000s to now, it's really been focused on, um, there's been more focus on Black history in general, but not that much in uh, older history books because it was created before 2020, well, 20, the 2000s. So with my methodology, so my methods included reading books by Black revolutionaries, curating Black studies based on Black revolutionary books, and um, I establish a weekly timeline to monitor my progress and to keep track of everything because I, I struggle with time management, so creating a weekly timeline was great for me in this project. And at first, my original deliverable was to create a booklet to present my findings. But as the weeks went on, I decided for more creative deliverable, which would be a menu style deliverable where I would present um, all my findings. Whoops. So here's a generalization of my findings. Uh, my main question that I asked myself during this project was why are American history books missing so many key parts of black history? So the next few slides, I'll just go over a general summary of my findings. Uh, many American history books were written by historical victors of America. Much of the black history recorded um, for public education is just on slavery and the civil rights movement. Even when, even when acknowledged as Americans in um, history books, um, white Americans believe that uh, black Americans wouldn't truly be able to integrate into white America. And when referenced as, and when referenced to the like noun Americans, that only reference to white people living in America um, in history books. Um, another finding was um, American history is rooted in white supremacy. So indirectly, racism is still prevailing in what was and wasn't recorded for generations of Americans to learn. And here are a few of my event-related findings. In my deliverable, I mainly focused on riots and massacres, but I did make sure to include accomplishments. So here are some of different riots that not a lot of people know about. Um, and I didn't, I'll, in, my, in my reflection, I'll talk more about this, but there's a lot that I didn't know about. The only one I knew about from this list was the um, Tulsa race riots, the Birmingham riot, and the Los Angeles riots, well, East Los Angeles and Los Angeles riots, because I'm from Los Angeles, so, um, and I was born in 1998, and those riots from 91 and 92 still affected um, my city even when I was born and even till even after I was born. Um, yes. And the reason why I included both positives and negatives of Black history is because all American history books have is a portion of the ugly and it's very whitewashed portion. There were racial rights and, ma and massacres that no one even knows about, as I was even saying, like referencing the ones like there's something I didn't know. Um, 
And for the current generation, it's not our fault that we don't know it because we don't know what we don't know. And by that, I mean that when we're searching for things, we don't know what we're searching for because there's a lack of information of what to search for, if that makes sense. Um, and here are accomplishments that had such an impact on American history as a whole because of Black people. Um, but these events or items may not seem that familiar. And for results, while reflecting on my findings of the accomplishments, I was able to determine that many events that are not included in American history books are events that do not include Black trauma. Black people, uh, well, Black history is not just about oppression, and not a lot of people know or acknowledge that. During this project, I learned more information about Black history than I first knew going in, as I was saying in the beginning. And as a Black person, or as a Black woman, I try to stay knowledgeable about Black history and specifically general generational history. So history that pretty much is um, like directly from like my grandparents um, and my parents' years. Um, and there are so many things that I did not know and I'm grateful to know now. And then my last slide are here my sources for the project. There, um, the only sources that are not noted here are the American history books that I read to get a general understanding of what black history education is at the moment. And those books include um, history books by the publishers, McGraw-Hill Education and Pearson Education. And uh, that's it. I know I talk fast, so that was probably very fast. But yeah, that's it. Meg, I, thanks, Caitlin. Meg, I can't remember whether it's going to go first or it's my turn. You know, I'll just I'll I'll go first. Um, and I'm hearing a little bit of echo. I'm not sure why, but um, maybe if people that aren't talking mute that would help. We'll see if that's the, yeah, that seems to have helped. Um, so, so interesting, Caitlin. Um, and I guess I wonder, you know, from a standpoint of academia, my knee jerk reaction is to say, um, well, then we have to solve this with education, right? Um, starting, um, you know, very early. Um, I'm wondering, um, you know, when I think about textbooks and I look at my, uh, so I have a 19, a 17, and a 13-year-old, and I look at my 13-year-old's textbook, um, it's pretty dated. Um, so I guess my question for you is, uh, it, from the perspective of education, um, is there an opportunity to rewrite textbooks? Um, is that where we should be starting? Um, or given your, your research and your expertise in this area, what are your recommendations? Because um, there are some pretty significant gaps. And, and I think we're talking about a couple different things. One is the people that are out of, um, out of primary, secondary education and how, how do we fill their gaps? But I guess in thinking about the generations to come, how, how do we solve that? What, how, what would you recommend that we do? So to answer your question, I do believe that rewriting textbooks is the best option. I mean, textbooks themselves are being updated. There's a new edition almost every year, and a lot are just not um, staying. A lot are just not as transparent as they should be. But yeah, rewriting textbooks, updating textbooks um, for American history is the best avenue for this situation. Okay, Stephen, I'll pass that to you. I really enjoyed that, Caitlin, thank you. Okay, Caitlin, um, this is a subject that I'm very interested in, Not obviously I'm not black, but just history in general. And I remember when I was first going, becoming a teacher many years ago, and I was hired to teach English and history, this was in England, and there was a set curriculum and it was supposed to be kings and queens. And at that time, uh, it was shortly after the, uh, the uh, troubles between in, in Northern Ireland were, had just kicked off. And, and I thought it was much more important to talk about the history of Eng England and Ireland. 
and uh, and so I changed the curriculum uh, without permission, and I got into trouble for that because uh, some parents complained that uh, you know I was supposed to be talking about the kings and queens of the 15th century, not about Ireland. So I this is a subject which I think is very interesting. Um, of course, history is always being rewritten anyway. Uh, um, right now, you you may have noticed this 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 week, uh, President Biden recognized uh, that the uh, the uh, killing of, of, of hundreds of thousands of Armenians in, in the First World War by the Turks, it, it, now we recognize as genocide. And, and until this week, uh, the US did not recognize that as a genocide. So that's an example of history being uh, covered up uh, and rewritten as we, as we, as culture changes, I guess. Um, so I, my, my question to you is, you know, there's national history, there's history that gets written in textbooks which are sold on a national level, but there's also local history. And, um, you know, I'm interested in genealogy. And if I was black, let's say I was black and I lived in, in well, wherever, it doesn't matter where I live, but let's say my family going back came from the South, which is probably more likely if I was black. And I would be interested in, in um, you know, my grandparents and their parents, et cetera, et cetera. Do you know much about local history? I mean, it's not the same thing as national history. Uh, are, are the records, if, if I wanted a record of, uh, of, uh, of my grandparents or my grandparents' parents, say in, I don't know, Mississippi or Alabama or someplace, would I be able to get that? Is that available? Is that, was, was, were those sorts of records kept for black people? So it just depends on the location. Um, many of those type of records are usually recorded in newspapers. So the um, collection of the newspapers usually um, are the records that you would reference. Um, but in terms of history books, there's not that much that is for public education. You might find some books um, in in your libraries that are by small authors just to summarize different events but it's not a common thing especially for um, the education of those students in those local areas yeah i i I'm, I'm a very big supporter of local history and teaching about local history i mean the nationals the world history and national history is a whole different dimension but i think local history is very important and I would hope that you know the, the records of being kept, whether or not white or black. But I don't. Of course, I don't know that. Um, so I would think that. I don't think you made this point. I would think that you know black studies departments, uh, programs, and universities started. I don't know, probably in the seventies, early seventies, and proliferated since then. So I would hope that there was a lot more emphasis now on black history within the context of the US than, than there was, say, in the 50s and 60s. That's probably true, right? Yes, but it's kind of disproportionate because Black history is kind of, or Black studies is given as an elective and not a main course curriculum of American history. So other than, other than your suggestion, other than your hope that history books uh, in K through 12 curriculum will be updated and rewritten as, as we get more knowledge and become more sensitive to the histories of, of different uh, races. What, 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 what else would you suggest? And, and, and follow, another question, related question, why did you do that? What led you to do this project? Are you, are you interested in becoming a teacher? Is, is that why? I am not interested in being a teacher at all. I I I like leading people to um, find uh, like new understandings about stuff, but I don't have the patience to be a teacher. Um, I, as a student at RIT, I've grown to be a mentor to students, and of course, that can be seen as like teaching can be a more um, wide range for mentorship, but in terms of mentor someone and then formally giving them education that's not my forte um i do for i did forget your first question though what was your first 
Oh, it, it wasn't. It wasn't a very specific question. I, I just wondered how you would, uh, where you see room for uh, for improvement for for making black history, bringing black history more to you know to common knowledge, um, other than just rewriting textbooks. I mean, where, uh, do you have any suggestions about how? Uh, we might the, uh, the the general population in the U.S. might become more knowledgeable about Black history. Um, well, for the current generation, I um, I don't know how to put a nice way to put it, but I don't have a real faith in the education of people who are outside of um, K through twelve right now. I think that. Um, just like how we learned about like the Boston Tea Party and other different um, like Paul Paul Revere and everything like that. We learned about all those like random aspects or events in history. The same thing can be um, kind of integrated of Black history into American textbooks. Um, and that itself isn't a hard thing to do, especially being that so many editions are made every decade and even looking at or reflecting on certain textbooks by large um uh like Ma like mcgraw hill they had a issue well, it was a few years it's probably like seven to ten years ago but reflecting on what their version of slavery was it was more just like slavery was just indentured servitude and with that even looking at slavery and kind of whitewashing and sugarcoating it that is just not okay and so being that the history that is even presented in history books is just not the full story even for it to be K through 12, so it needs to be kind of not as um, violent and vulgar to those students um, based on the age, it's still not real history. Well, let me throw a hypothetical at you. I suppose it's a little personal, and, but, and you may not have thought about it, but let's say you have a child um, and this child is in, I don't know, fifth grade or fourth grade, and um, you, you know, you look at the t the history textbook, and you, you think it's not not good enough. And you and what what would you do about that? Well, for me, that's kind of what my parents had to deal with, and they just took their time to teach me a little bit more about Black history. My great grandma was actually a teacher and so she had a lot of different black history books just in her library so even though they were kind of at a more higher reading level um than what i was at she did kind of um, dumb it down for me so that i can really understand it and if that type of teaching was kind of just scaled to all public education i believe that students will understand it and learn it and actually know it and um it doesn't have to be like labeled as from slavery to just indentured servitude for people to know that um this type of history like happened um something happened oh it looks like you muted yourself oh yeah i, I I was done. <laughs> Are you still there? Yes. I, I can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I think you just were muted again. <laughs> yeah, I I finished my thought, so I'm muted. <laughs> okay. Oh, I see. <laughs> Click on the draw. Uh, one last question. So, you know, this is we we ask a lot of students this after they've done with their project. Where, where are you going to take, are you going to take this any place? Are, are you going to expand? Are you, are you going to, you know, read more about this? Are you, uh, what are you going to do with this project? Or is it standalone? Is, you know, is it, are you going to take it further? Um, I believe that I will look more into different accomplishments that are not noted in Black history. Um, even when I was doing research for this, I really just ran into negatives about Black history and didn't really come across that many positives. 
And of course, I, I came across like hundreds of positives, but just the proportion of negatives to positives, I didn't find that much. So I think just for educating myself personally, I will be looking more into positive accomplishments that are not highlighting Black trauma. Um, yes, that's where I'm going to be going with this project. Okay, thanks, Caitlin. Um, um, I, enjoyed, I enjoyed your project, uh, your your presentation, and uh, I hope it, you know you do take it further. I think it's important. Okay, anybody else with any questions? I just um, just a comment or or a question um, for Caitlin. Um, would or for anybody would not segregating the histories because i i saw the segregation growing up myself and how and i actually didn't see the segregation until i was older and didn't realize there's a big piece and it was black history that was missing from my education all through you know high school and kind of really realized that somewhere in my 20s when i realized that um that i dream uh the um i have a dream speech was huge. I, I'd only heard snippets of it and realized not until my 20s it was it a very long speech and beautiful speech I had never heard and I was angry that I had never heard this in school that I had never been presented with this in school. So I wonder is the desegregation of history going to be what it takes to to one bring people back together because I think that's important but stop calling it black history versus you know white history or whatever it is and just it's 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 our history good and bad and you know everything in between is that where where it needs to go is that something that people think because that's what i think so i don't know i love um, the topic thank you for bringing it up uh so yeah. for your first points yes i believe that um kind of merging black history into white history or american history education is necessary um because as i was even saying earlier just having black history as an elective is just not it's not right because then people kind of get to pick and choose what they're learning and i believe that as a whole the, these are things that we should have known already we shouldn't have to like have something as an elective i don't agree with um kind of erasing color and merging it from white history and black history into just a general American history, because that can kind of um, erase the real generational issues that black people have gone through. I do understand your point for that though, because it's something that everybody should know and it shouldn't really be a quote unquote black and white thing, but as a whole in terms of how black people are treated in America, just understanding the isolation of that history being something that is attached to like my DNA, my blood, my skin. Like this is not something that like a white person can really relate to. Like white people can get educated on it, but in relations to understanding how it is to be a black person, just even black woman in America is something that only black people can understand and truly get. Anybody else? No, thank you. Thank you for the comments. Okay, great. Good question, Sarah. All right, um, and you're up. So uh, you've warmed up now. Take it away. Oh, dang. Now I'm nervous. Okay, so the, hold on. Let me get my screen share put together. I wanted to start off um, with just a video that I had found um, that I wanted to share with you guys first. And so I'm gonna expand it. Um, so um, first off, um, before I go into the video, my project is, um, I call it the Forget Me Not Project. It is um, an idea to create a child safety device that will or would um, 
hopefully eliminate the unnecessary deaths that occur when children are left in vehicles, whether whether it's an extremely hot temperature or extremely cold, or even in cases, um, you know, expand it past that, where maybe there's an accident and it's a remote area and, and, you know, maybe the device is the only thing that alerts, you know, the authorities and people nearby that, hey, there's an issue that needs to be checked out. So um, that's the project is, again, the Forget Me Not project, but I'm going to start with this video. Can you see my screen? Yep. The, the car. Okay. I don't know if you'll be able to hear the video or audio. It's not moving. It's not moving? Yeah. Okay. Um, how do I new screen? Let me try again. Pause, share, annotate, stop, share. Let me try one more time. I apologize. No problem. Advanced share. Okay, share sound. Okay, let me do that. Okay, let me start again. I can't see if it's moving on your guys' end. This I'm well, confused. we've got it. You, it's fifteen seconds into the video now, which it wasn't before. It was at the beginning before. I don't know. Okay, if you move it back. To the beginning. I'm starting it again. Every now we can hear the audio, but the, the big, the, it's, it's, it's still not working. In a vehicle. Okay. In well, 70 degree weather. It takes I'm not sure why. Minutes. I'm going to go ahead and just move forward then. Okay. Let me turn off this video on my side. Basically, it was just a, it's a little infomercial PSA um, commercial about how easily it can be to forget your child in the back seat of a car. Um, because that's always the question. How do you forget your kid? How do you forget your child? And so what it talks about is parents can be distracted. Sometimes parents can, um, if there's a schedule change that parents will often feel or think that the baby's with the babysitter or with the other parent. Um, sometimes it's a grandparent that forgets the child. Uh, sometimes it's a babysitter. And unfortunately, during my research, I found that sometimes it's intentional where children are left in cars with the hopes that they will perish. I have no idea. Um, so the forget me device is to be um, two components. It's a hardware device that would be attached to the car seat. And this would be in my in my design aspects, a buckle that would go on with the, um, the car seat that could be replaced because those are all replaceable parts on car seats are the buckles. So you'd replace that with a hardware that would be able to link then to a software application on your phone that when the buckle is clipped, it would activate that device. Then that device would, would go to um, your phone and you would be able to see what was going on in the car. So the device itself would have a thermometer in it or temperature gauge in it. It would have a notification proximity alert in it. And then if you yourself did not take action to, to alleviate the situation, whatever it was, it would notify the local authorities um, for that. So this is the idea of the device. So it's a very grand idea of this device that I don't know how to build. And that's what my capstone project has been on is trying to figure out how to build this device. Um, let me pull up my PowerPoint so it can guide me a little bit more. One second. Um, share screen again. Okay, share. Looks good. Okay. I'm, and let me know if you can start. I'm clicking through the slides. Can you see the next slide? No. What is happening? How did you do this? I don't know how to do this. Can you do it manually? Just click on the next slide. No, I did. I did, but I don't know why it's not. I don't know why. Maybe I'm sharing it wrong. I'm so sorry. I'm going to try again. So I click on share, right? Yeah. And I choose the screen that I want. Is that, and that's all I do, right? I think so. And then I would go to from beginning. From so beginning. It isn't pulled up just yet. We don't see it yet. No, yeah, I, I didn't share it. Um, okay. Portion of screen video. 
PowerPoint as virtual. No, I don't want to do that. I just want to share my screen share. That's a screen share. And then it goes to the next slide. It's a Okay, that's oh. a, we, we haven't seen that slide before. My Zoom just said it stopped working. It hasn't. I can see. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. So, so this okay, slide so says, good. this slide says, forget me not at the top with the flower. And it says a simple device yep. that will yep. alert parents. Yeah. Okay, so that's where we're at. Okay. So um, so it's, Leia said, a simple device that will alert parents of this and the surrounding community and authorities of a child is left in a car seat for an extended period of time. The device um, will alarm if the child is in danger from being left um, in heat or cold, um, such things as the ambient temperature um, for hot and cold left in the car seat with a daycare or home provider, and then also car accidents. Um, during my, my research, and it's just, it makes me cry every time I do research on it, but there are just so many cases where children are accidentally left, but I think the ones that got me the most, again, were the purposeful cases, and then the cases where the children are left in car seats with home care providers or daycare providers all day long, and the parents are, are not aware of it. Um, so, you know, and, and there's just, there's just too many cases about those sorts of things. Um, okay. Um, so it would, the core features would sense when the child enters the car seat and when the child is removed from the car seat would track, monitor ambient temperatures, alert parents if the ambient temperature hits a pre-programmed levels, alert, alert community authorities if ambient temperatures hits that pre-programmed levels as well, but if the parents don't take action. Um, track and notify GPS location. And then the ultimate goal would be to link with a service like OnStar, who already has the infrastructure similar to what they do with their vehicles already um, to, to be able to, um, I, that's the only way I can think that link to the authorities would take place is to partner with them and then they can notify the authorities um, for that. Um, so that it would be a chest buckle design the and the activation would be in the buckle and the reason I decided that the buckle would be best because there's there's other project products out there that are similar um some of them are based off of a weight so if the baby's in the car seat then it will notify um some of them are buckle related some of them are very simple and it's like a pull string to notify that you have a child in the back um but I was looking at the buckle more so because I with I have children and with my two children and the two car seats that I have, I often throw, you know, groceries or stuff in there when my kids are not in there. And so I didn't want it to activate if the child wasn't there. So with the buckle being closed, that's, you're not going to close the buckle unless your child's buckled in, is, is the point of it. Um, but once that's closed, it will activate the buckle, which then will link to the software um, device, the software app on your phone. So the technology is is what I really have been struggling with trying to find out, um, and this is where a lot of the research has been um, lately. So I kind of started off with more of the design and the pretty stuff, which you'll see in the mobile app and all that kind of stuff, because that was fun. And then I started diving into the technology. Um, I don't really know much about um, the different wireless technologies. I know more now because of because of this project. Um, but the wireless technology that we would be utilizing would be radio frequency technology. There's actually two main wireless technologies that can be used and that's um, infrared light and radio. And radio was the one that we'd have to use because that's the only one that wouldn't have the limitations the infrared light has because it doesn't go through walls and it doesn't, you know, you can't, it doesn't go through it. You have to have line of sight and all that for infrared light. Um, um, technology for wireless technology because it would be a wireless device. Um, we would use um, the RF technology and it would be based off of the cellular towers. Um, and I've actually got my, my main research book here. I wanted to show you guys this. I if I can find it. I don't have it marked. I apologize. Anyways, it would be off of cellular towers or the satellites. Because when you deal with RF technology, you have low 
um, what is it, low range technology like Bluetooth and uh, Wi-Fi and those sorts of things those are low range. And so you don't, you won't get the, um, the proximity, you won't get the distance that you need. So it would have to be working off a cellular network, which in the development of a product means that we'd have to go through the cellular companies to be able to use their networks for this one product to work, which in my research is a little expensive and I'm not still quite sure how, how to go about that. So that's, that's something that's still being worked on. I'm not sure. Um, continuing technology, this I got from um, an expert who builds hardware. So I'm still trying to figure out all of these um, different components in my research. Um, but this is what was the basic list that they said would make this um, device work in the fashion that I'd like it to work in. Um, so there's um, these things called the accelerometer and the gyroscope, which when I was looking at is what helps with the rotation of the earth, because the earth is always rotating to make sure that the connection is always there with the, with the app. And that's what that's supposed to do. Um, then there's the sensory array, which will do the temperature part, the battery, um, this was the battery because I was talking to him, you know, it had to have a battery that would last a long time that didn't need a lot of charge. And this is the one that, that they came back with. Um, the um, power management integrated circuit would be what would hold all the power in and all that, make sure that it didn't, um, didn't drain out a battery too soon with the charging port. And then the sensory part, of, and this is the hardware, would be what would light up to let you know that when it was activated, but also if it was losing a charge. If that makes sense. If it would need to be charged. Oh, wrong one. Um, the mobile app design was a lot more fun because it's mobile app design. Um, this is just mock-ups that were created. Um, so you'd have your sign up thing. So the idea is you would get your device and then you would have to pair that device um, and then that would go through your mobile app. Once you pair the device, they would be your device and you could pair more than one devices for people who have more than one child like myself and they would all be on your mobile app. So those are all kind of the mock-up screens there for the, for the sign up. And then you have your, your notifications. So in the first one, it says that the device is off. Um, you can see at the very top, if I can highlight it somewhere over here, you know, there's no baby sensor here. And so that means that there's, you know, it's off, there's nothing going on. Um, for that. That means that the hardware device itself is off. Then you go into where the, the hardware device is active or on, but not active. Um, um, just to say that, hey, it's ready to go, I guess. That was, I guess I have to look back at that because that's kind of weird, but um, no child is detected. These are just some things that we were thinking of that would alert them. Um, and then of course the green is the baby is in the car seat and, and you're good to go. So you have to watch for your baby and be back there. Um, there's the heat warning kind of advisement things that were mocked up and they just kind of go through, you know, it's getting really hot, you know, get back to your baby. It's getting super hot. And then, you know, emergency has been sent and we're going to call authorities. Same thing with the cold for that. Um, and this is just some headlines that were um, some current ones that had happened. Um, like I said, I, every time I um, go through this, it makes me cry every single time. Um, but just why it's so important, because as the video was trying to tell you, there's about 40 to 50 kids that are, that, um, sorry, gosh, that die in cars every single year. And I just think it's ridiculous. And a lot of the times it's just because parents get overworked and overwhelmed and and while people can't don't think that they will ever forget their child it happens it happens way too much um and then of course also the purposeful people leaving their children i just i can't even imagine but anyways that's that's that i don't think i did a very good job presenting it because there's a lot still to do but go ahead with your questions okay sarah um it's a very ambitious project and I oh, it's been stupid a lot to learn. I've got, I, I ordered like seven different books and I just, I started with the one book of learning the different components. I was like, well, let me start with the hardware. Let me see what components are me. And I was like, I don't know what this is talking about. I was like, okay, let me back up and let me start with the technology. And so that now I actually feel like I'm making headway because I'm still reading and researching. Um, and you'll probably ask the question that you asked previously, where are you going to do with this and continue on? 
So I'm just, I, I am going to continue on because number one, the reading of the wireless technology is, is extremely interesting and, and something that I, I didn't think I'd ever be interested in, but the more that I read, the more that I'm interested in learning about that technology and about programming itself um, for my own purposes, but also, you know, for my own, my kids. I'm not a science tech person. I do compliance and I push paperwork and it's kind of boring. And so I kind of feel like that's a new avenue to, to explore is maybe something to jump off to, but, but yeah. Go maybe ahead with your question. Sorry. Maybe you, maybe you missed your vocation. So most people, in fact, almost everybody uh, who takes this course starts from something they already know and just expands out from there. It sounds like you've started from something that you didn't already know. You just had the idea and, uh, and, and you, you're, you're putting it into practice. So more power to you. This is, this is uh, really something. So I would think um, I, I absolutely can see how you might forget. I mean, I go into Wegmans, 20% of the time I forget the mask, I have to go back to the car. Another 20% of the time I forget to take a shopping bag, I have to go back to the car. So, you know, it's obviously not the same when, you, when you're talking about a human being, but, but forgetting is something that uh, we all unfortunately do. So, so it seems to me that the, there's a couple of situations that you're trying to address. One is just honest, I, I forgot that my child was in the car. You just don't think about it as you leave the car. And then there's the other thing is, you know your child was in the car because you left them there intentionally and you went into the store and then you forgot, right? I mean, it's, that's, that's a slightly different situation. Um, so so you, are you, is your plan to actually produce this, to actually make it and, and maybe market it? I mean, you, you mentioned... It, it, at one point that there are similar devices already on the market, right? So where, where does your, where do, where do your plans fit with that? So, yeah, so the original idea was to maybe uh, produce it and, and make it, um, but, um, you know, when looking at, because I, I wouldn't be able to do that just knowing my limitations and working through the technology um, um, for that, um, that I wouldn't be able to get it to market in a reasonable time frame. Um, so I was looking at maybe getting product developers, but that is about to cost about $100,000, which I just don't have $100,000 like laying around. Um, but then also when I was doing research, I did see that there are already products out there and there's actually some that already have the same name. Um, so I, so maybe I was thinking, and uh, not maybe, but so then my thought was, okay, don't manufacture it because it's already out there, but how do you get it to be mandatory? And actually right now there is a um, push at the federal level to make this sort of device um, a requirement, not necessarily in the car seat, but at the, in the vehicles. I don't know if you've noticed in some vehicles, there'll be like a little display that comes up and say, don't forget to check your back seat those sorts of things. There's um, um, debate on the federal side that's going to try to make that that mandated for all new cars that are being built, that that notification would be there. Um, there's some other organizations out there that are pushing to require car seats, manufacturers to have this sort of capability to do that. So there are some car seat developers who are already implementing it. Like I said, there's already devices out there. So it looks like the market is already getting saturated. So I don't know from a business investment sense, it would make sense to do that, um, um, but more so to to maybe push push for that legislation, you know, on on a personal level. Right, mm -hmm. sort of advocacy role. Uh, mm -hmm. I I knew by one remove the, the the person who was very active in in getting seatbelts, uh, you know, uh, legislated for decades ago. Mm. So certainly, it sounds like that. That might be a little more more accessible to you, uh, not being a technician or having a hundred thousand dollars lying around. But. Right. <laughs> I mean, who's got that? I don't know. But um, yeah, it's very interesting. Another note on that: um, the issue with the kids being left started um, when they started mandating that kids be in the back seat with the rear-facing car seats, um, yeah. and that's when the huge increase came up with with you know kids being being left because you know you don't see them and if they're asleep. You don't always hear them, you know, and I just, I think because of my reading and just 
the tragic stories, I just, I'm always at, I just always look, even if I'm certain they're not there, because I have, I have two young kids, you know, and I just have, I was like, oh my God, what, where did they go? What did I do with them? Because so you do, you, know you get overwhelmed. Do you know your congressperson? I don't, I don't know. No, I'd have to, I'd have that's, to figure that out. That's the way to go. It's worth, it's worth doing. Uh, okay. I have, Great project. Like I say, you, you're very brave to have started something from scratch like that, something so complex. Uh, Meg? Thanks, Stephen. Um, so, Sarah, my, um, my reaction to this situation is very similar to yours. Um, in fact, I, I can remember, um, like I mentioned, I have three teenagers, but when they were young, I can remember being so panicked that I would forget them, that I would go into a full panic when they weren't even in the car. Like I never had them to begin with. Um, so, uh, you know, I, it's, it's such a real fear. What, what would you see are some of the limitations um, in implementing something like a, a reminder to check the back seat? I'll, I'll be honest, there are some reminders that pop up on my car now. I've seen them so many times that I, I don't even pay attention to them anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. so, so what would you see? And, the, and those are new cars. There are so many families, of course, that are not buying new cars. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I guess I wonder, um, through your research, um, is there any data yet on some of these products that already exist? Um, and what is some of the, the low hanging fruit that you could maybe recommend that, that we do? Um, I, I think on a federal level, implementing on car seats, your idea is amazing. Um, I wonder about cost. Um, you know, I, I, I guess I wonder, what do you see as some of the limitations? No, and that's a good question. So um, um, there, I couldn't find any research data about that, but there was some concerns um, looking at some of the product reviews on the other ones that were available of a false sense of security, which I think would be a huge a huge issue was and that and I didn't and I didn't really foresee that until I started reading those comments I was like that would make sense because you do you you know you ignore those alerts you ignore those sorts of things um so I think a false sense of security you know if the app doesn't tell your kids back there maybe the kid's not back there and so that's more of you know double checking yourself but also you know pay attention to the one app that's going to tell you that your kids you know probably in a hot, hot car somewhere you know maybe it's a big old chime that says we're here um that's why the push would be to also link with a larger organization like onstar who already has the infrastructure in place um to alert authorities and those sorts of things if 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 a situation isn't um taken care of i don't know have you guys ever worked with onstar before mm -hmm. they were yeah, so what did, oh, I'm sorry, they're my savior. I had personally locked my own baby into the car accidentally while I was right there because I was had a rental car and it locked. I just, I didn't expect it to lock. I was just, I went to go get the diaper bag from the other side and the door closed and it latched just perfectly and it locked because it was a brand new car and it locked. And so there's my baby sitting there and I almost broke the damn window, but luckily I was able to call Arnstar in about 30 seconds and they had it open again remotely it was amazing um so they have those capabilities um is, is my point because i freaked out and i was about to destroy that car um um but um yeah so i think the limitation is the false security really to answer your question mm -hmm. i think it's false security for that i think there would also be some false alerts um you know especially in any new development any technology that that would have to be worked out, you know, to make sure that it was, you know, resources, police resources weren't being used or abused, um, those sorts of things. But ultimately, I think it could save lives. As far as the low hanging fruit, um, um, there are products, there's one, I think it's called the Elephant Clip. And you can just, it's like on Amazon, it just wasn't really hard to find. It was the Elephant Clip that clips on. Um, there was one that's called the Forget Me Not that was being developed. Um, but it stopped being developed. It, you can't buy it. It was about six or seven years ago. So it had the same name and I was kind of bummed out about that, but they had actually developed a hardware device and an application very similar to, to this idea, but it's nowhere and you can't find it. So I'm not sure the limitations of what happened there, you know, for that. So, um, yeah, I don't know. 
Well, really interesting. Um, I, I am really impressed. Um, one of the questions we normally ask is, um, you know, uh, the distance between what you already knew and what you learned. And, um, and I think you've done a phenomenal job on a variety of different aspects and really pushing yourself to learn a lot. Um, yeah, so, I'm you know. trying. I would have more time without my two kids, but you know, it is what it is. <laughs> Well, where would your inspiration be right <laughs> right where would i where would i what do you want yeah i've got a three-year-old and an 18 month or a 20 month old now i guess he's not 18 months but um, wow it's busy but well um, no like i said the technology you. is very interesting the wireless aspect technology is i think i think the big takeaway for me on this project is learning the technology that i just i don't know i use it every day i mean i'm using it now my cell phone laptop you know wireless internet you know it's it's but I don't know anything about it. So it's pretty interesting. Join the club. Okay. Uh, I just, can I say one thing, Stephen? I just, um, sure. I have two young children myself, Sarah, and um, just hits close to home. So I didn't lock my child in the car, but he went outside to get something out of the car and I was in the house and he's, I don't remember, it might've been two years ago. So he might've been six even. And he got himself into the car and we have child locks on the back seat. And he couldn't get the door back open because the child locks, the door closed behind him. And it was in the summer. And I was inside with our infant at that time. And I was probably breastfeeding. And so all of a sudden I thought he should be back by now. You know, he's been out there, you know, a little bit. So I went out and he had locked himself in the car. You know, he mm. got locked in there and he didn't know enough to go into the front seat and open the doors. And after that, I mean, it was terrifying for me. And I got on and did research like you did after the fact and thought, oh my God, like I could have killed my kid basically. You know, you have these mm -hmm, moments. Mm -hmm. And so I really think like with Steven, the, the advocating for education and that kind of thing, because I then went online and did a bunch of research and really it was all about, you know, there was tons of stuff out there about me talking to my kids too, about what to do if, I mean, they're a little bit older than infants and one-year-olds who are locked right. in the first seats, but really this educational piece for parents, even talking to their kids about like, what do you do if you're locked in the car? And so that education piece, I think is huge, even on a small local level where you could make a difference, you know, those kinds of things are really important if this technology piece, you know, is sort of big and ugly. I mean, I watch Shark Tank, so I can see something like this being on Shark Tank, right? Like, oh, there, there she is. Oh, right there. Yeah, yeah, they give Shark you a million Tank. dollars and give you developers and manufacturers. But um, so if you're not going to figure Shark out how to get on Shark Tank, maybe, maybe yeah, maybe this whole um, sort of education legislation piece is, is a, really a way to make an impact too. Yeah, and that is a good point because there is some instance, um, some research that says that kids do, they get locked in, they do lock themselves into vehicles. Kids, right? And it's, and I'm not really sure how to solve that one, except for probably that education portion, you know, because I think it is, you know, yeah. if they're old enough to get in, you got to get back out. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. Well, and one of the things that was so simple, they just said, tell your kid to honk the horn, like crawl in the front right. and honk the horn. Someone will come. And I think, oh my God. Yes. <laughs> right. So. Right. For sure. For sure. That's my, yes. Okay. We, uh, we do have to move on. Um, uh, else Frank will think that we, we've, uh, forgotten him. So Frank, I mean, uh, we could just keep going. I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> Um, All right, Frank, the floor is yours. So I do just want to start off, uh, like Sydney brought up, um, Sarah, your uh, project uh, concerns, not concerns education, but, you know, uh, advocates for more education and Caitlin as well, you know, advocates for more education. I think that's like the central theme of all our projects is that we're like kind of like pushing this, uh, pushing more ed more information and education out there. And uh, I just wanted to say fun fact this morning, you know, I I saw Caitlin was presenting, I was reading through the descriptions, and today I think is the 29th anniversary since the Los Angeles riots, and Caitlin, your, your, your project was very insightful, you know, I, I did not know, I knew maybe two of the riots that you brought up, so, like, it, it just goes to show how uneducated we truly are, and Sarah, I thought the uh, buckle was a great idea, and uh, the, the F design was very nice, so I just wanted to start off by saying that, but, uh, so my project was encyclopedia, I encyclopedia, excuse me, uh, and can you guys see that? Yep. That's so my good. slideshow is, is relatively short. Um, it's eye encyclopedia, an online encyclopedia all about the eye. So uh, a little bit about me is um, when I was younger, my dad brought home this book, the great book of optical illusions, you know, and uh, 
like many kids, I was fascinated. You know, I, I see the, you see the legs on the front and I'm like, whoa, you know, and it had tons of just different optical illusions. And I think that's kind of where my first uh, love for illusions came to be. And like, like, because uh, personally, I should start off by saying too, I'm in vision, uh, vision science, uh, kind of tailor-made, you know, because we're in choice. I've done imaging science and I've also done psychology and perception. And I kind of want to tailor myself more towards uh, my field is broad. You know, I could go into more. I have a couple of my first ideas I was talking over with uh, Stephen were building uh, eye trackers, you know, or, or even hand trackers, you know, and uh, it seemed a little bit out of my scope. Um, but I always had a love for education and, and, and teaching others. Um, so this is kind of why, why my project is tailored the way it is. But anyways, uh, my love for illusions and perceptions came to be when my dad brought home this book. And also my grandpa used to show me these, these uh, magic eye illusions or, or stereograms, they call them. And uh, this one's not the best example of it. Uh, it's kind of hard to see. I don't know if you guys know how to see it, but I'll, I'll, get, I'll definitely get into more of that later. Um, but basically he would show me them in the newspaper. They used to be all over the place. And, uh, you know, so seeing this and, and seeing the, the optical illusions, you know, I was always like driven to, to, to know how, how are these images tricking us, you know, and, and all that. So like, that's kind of why I am doing what I'm doing now. But anyways, um, so a couple of main goals of my site, site were to provide free and reputable information about vision. You know, um, I kind of really dislike how information is stuck behind a paywall nowadays, kind of, you know, unless you're in an institution that has access to free journals and everything like that, you know, it, it's not hard to get accurate information, but with the state of media and technology today, it's kind of hard to know what information is actually true. You know, so, so one of my goals for, for the website was to provide information that is 100% fact, you know, this is what, you know, you want to know, this is where you can go, and this is where you can find uh, more information about said topics. Um, like I said also before, um, personally, I, when I first came to RIT, I asked, uh, do you have an education program? You know, I wanted to be a teacher myself, so I wanted to provide resources that help reinforce the information that, are, that is provided on the website. Um, you know, my, uh, this goes back to reputable information. Uh, a lot of the information I took from my website um, is from various different textbooks and resources. So if you do want to know more, you can refer back to these sources uh, and expand your general knowledge. Um, and also, you know, um, like I said, my, my field is very broad, but I think teachers kind of out of the picture for me now. Um, I do plan on going to, to uh, take an optician course and become an optician and then eventually apply to optometry school um, in a year or two about. So I kind of want this website to serve as like, a, this is everything I know. You know, this is boom, like right here. And uh, also like keep the brain fresh. You know, I'm, I am gonna be out of school for a little bit while I am working to save up money for tuition and everything like that. So by updating this website uh, weekly or, or, or monthly, anything like that, I could just keep my brain refreshed on the topics. So uh, textbooks used, ABCs of the eyes, uh, talked a lot about the um, different uh, diseases and ailments in the eye, as well as treatments. The eye, the physiology of human perception, talks a lot about uh, how we see and the, the structure of the eye and, and how these uh, uh, pieces of the eye function together. Uh, cognitive neuroscience talks about visual pathways and it relates to how illusions, uh, how illusions trick us. Uh, the Oxford, uh, I'm not gonna, um, but visual illusions book pretty much uh, depicting a ton of visual illusions and uh, why they work and then uh, balanced website design. Uh, optimizing aesthetics and usability. So balanced website design was the first one I started off with uh, reading and kind of it just gave me pointers on how to organize my website in the way that makes it easy and digestible and manageable to read. Um, so like I said, it, 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 epitome, it, it epitomized, epitomized, it was the uh, symmetry, order and beauty it said. Um, while I think it's, it's my website isn't very symmetrical, but I, I love my website personally. I can't wait to get into it. Like I'm so proud of like what I was able to produce. Um, I think it has some aspect of beauty to it. Uh, it's very clean. Um, uh, so it also said successful websites need to be compatible with different browsers and platforms. And it's, it works on every browser, you know, and uh, when I was testing it, it wasn't functioning properly on phones. And everything like that and and you kind of do lose an aspect of like the, the beauty of it when you do 
uh, go look at it on a phone or anything, but it does work. Needless to say, it works. It works nice on tablets and phones also. Um, the homepage should provide a pleasant aesthetic and a good navigational route. You know, you don't want your, uh, your user to be lost. So that's kind of where um, I, uh, that's something I incorporated in my website. Uh, it's a dividing space is important also. Uh, you don't want your website to be too chunky. You know, you want to kind of break it up. So that's something I incorporated. And um, before creating the website, you know, as you guys went over too with this project, you know, manage your time separate things up, break, break things up and like establish a scope, a general dis description, constraints, your aim and ambition and a time scale. And those are all things I did to help kind of um, make sure I had a finished product by today or, you know, when, when this project's due. Um, so yeah, so our starting point, I gathered and grouped information from textbooks. I categorized this information to structure, ailments, treatments, educational tools, illusions, uh, and a glossary. I then began to write, you know, this is pretty much my project. Um, I created most of the images you'll see on the website um, if I didn't, they're public domain images. Um, so images that are just readily available, open access on the internet, and then putting it all together led to Encyclopedia. Icyclopedia, excuse, I can't even say my project right. But um, once the website was together, I uh, got peer advice from my friends, you know, who, who sat through it, read through it, you know, pointed out flaws and errors. And I, I went back in and I uh, changed things around and I optimized things to make sure everybody had a pleasant experience. So now, I'm going to take us to my cyclopedia. So this is my homepage. Uh, can you, everybody can see it? Just want to make sure. No. no. All right. My fault. There we go. All right. Awesome. 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 So starting off, iCyclopedia. Um, one of the the cool features uh, my roommate brought up too was you don't, he was like, you don't have a dark mode. You know, he was like, cause originally my website looks like this, you know, and he was like, oh, it's too bright, you know, and all that. And uh, I was like, you know, it'd be really cool to add a dark mode. So I put this little button in the bottom and it, and personally, like when, whenever you go on, if you have dark mode and it's uh, enabled on your website, uh, on your computer, it'll automatically apply dark mode to my website. So starting off, I wanted to gauge people, you know, with, with the, the range of eye colors that you could possibly have you know, and then kind of like this quote I really liked, uh, every now and then a man's mind is stretched by a new idea or sensation and never shrinks back to a former direction, uh, dimensions. I'm kind of rushing, I'm sorry. Um, and I, I just really like that quote, you know, I hope my website expands your mind a little bit so you learn uh, a little bit more about the eye and how we see, um, you know, and then we have a general description of my website, um, you know, and each of these are like clickable links, good navigational route, you know, you want to have, I also have this navigation bar up here, as well as a navigation bar up here, a disclaimer and a references button, just to, to keep everything, you know, well-rounded. Um, I do have a disclaimer. I didn't want to say I'm a medical professional. This is what you should do, you know, all that. There, there's tons of um, constraints, you know, uh, surgery is expensive and, and comes with complications. So, you know, Educational, you know, just just know what you know. Don't don't use my advice too much. Um, and then feedback, you know, a feedback button. Um, like I said, I hope to reach out to optometrists and op ophthalmologists, and I hope they give me feedback on, you know, oh wait, maybe Frank, you you shouldn't word it like this. Maybe this is too hard to understand. Reword it, you know. So I I, I wanted to add a feedback option. Getting into it, uh, we have structure. So I first, I talk about light, you know, and the, the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum um, and the light, the, the wavelengths that we, we see. So we see 380 nanometers, 700 nanometers. I then go into the eye um, and parts of the eye, the, the, the main parts of the eye, you know. Um, uh, and then I then break down the parts piece by piece, corneas, aqueous and vitreous humor, iris, pupil, crystalline lens, uh, toroid, retina, parts of the retina, macula, optic nerve. Um, now, before I, I, I go any further, I should say, uh, when I reference things, uh, it, it's described on my homepage, but I, I'll, I leave like a 122, you know? So this is the, the, the reference uh, that you'll find on my references page. And then this is the page number that that information was found on. So if we, I'm skipping through right now, but if we go to my references page, 
-hmm. you, you'll see um, the references it took to create each uh, section, you know, so getting back into it though however I, I i talked with steven briefly about how to incorporate references and while we had a footnotes idea and a reference like a separate references page i had footnotes at first and it, it just it was sloppy I, I i really didn't like it. it took away kind of like the aesthetic of the website i was going for so um i have like blind spot demonstrations as you can see here it works uh, so i like that frank, i enjoyed that frank I, i'm i'm very sorry but uh, can you wrap it up in the next couple of minutes? Yes, yes, no, no, no problem. So elements, just getting into elements. Uh, I'll be brief and quick with, with each. Um, my website's up, it's gonna stay up. Um, it, I talk about blurry vision, color, color vision deficiencies, uh, issues with the cornea, cataracts, glaucoma, issues with the retina and blindness. And then I also incorporated a little map, um, which uh, points you to optometrists in your area. I also have that on my treatment section. Treatment's also concerned. It also goes over visual acuity. So how your eyesight is measured, um, non-invasive solutions like glasses, contacts, uh, solutions to color deficiencies and how Ishihara plates work. LASIK, SPRK, uh, I can't say that. O and ocular genetics, which Stephen uh, uh, recommended me to uh, Dr. Alec, Alex Levin's uh, presentation, which I really enjoyed personally. I, I, I wanna talk so much more. Anyways. Uh, a brief history of optometry, um, how optometry kind of came to be and where, where like the industry started with all the way going back, going back to Plato and Aristotle. Illusions is one of my favorite sections personally working on it and maybe, you know, way back when, but this is the Ebbinghaus illusion, you know, and you could go like that, you see the illusion and then you don't see the illusion. And I have a couple more examples like that. Uh, the Herman grid, another magic eye, um, I kind of wanted to explain to you guys how this works personally so like everybody could see it, but I don't think we have time for that today. Uh, motion after effect, um, Muller liar, which also has this slider feature, um, negative after image, uh, Poggendorf, and now solutions to these images, you can click on the images and it'll pop up and, and you, you'd see like how the illusion tricks you kind of. Um, there's 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 a couple more you know vertical line illusion watercolor illusion which i the first time i ever saw this illusion was when i was doing research for this project and it really blew my mind uh and this ulnar illusion which also has another slide feature um getting into educational tools sorry uh, i also have a glossary added you know about all key terms on my website um and then these are functioning quizzes that you could take. So structure, which the rate, wavelengths, 380. Okay, good, you got it right. Or uh, part of the eye that first passes through. Oh, the retina. Oh, you got it wrong. You know, um, a main part of my website though was to provide free resources for teachers. You know, if they want to teach more, I my friend made these, I'm not gonna lie. But um, I sat with him while he, cause he's a medical illustration major. He showed me kind of how he uses Illustrator and Photoshop and he, he helped me make these images. Um, glossary like i said i can go into later but uh, my about section is kind of just a brief description of me and what i did and not what i did my future plans for this website uh, my future plans in general an email tailored to my website and then the, this feedback section and then if we just want to leave it off on glossary you can send feedback my little brother has sent some feedback like oh awesome job you know cool so it's nice to see but like i said i, I do have this glossary also which uh, highlights key terms on my website so I think that's all the time I have, I feel like, so. Meg? Okay, so um, Frank, sorry you felt like you had to um, rush through this. Uh, no, no, I, I, I hope it doesn't impact my grade negatively. I could talk, I feel like, for hours more if you really do want to get into it. No, of course it wouldn't impact your, your grade. Um, I have to say the, wow, okay. So th the website itself is absolutely gorgeous. Um, I, I mean, I, I just think the design aesthetic, the colors, the way you have everything laid out. Um, this isn't my area of study, but I, I, I know what I like and I know what's easy to, uh, when something's easy to digest information. So, I mean, it's phenomenal. Um, the, the naming of the site, um, I, I mean, I, I think that, I think that you're a lifelong learner and I love that you have taken a project 
um, that is really about your learning, but you're really interested in open sourcing the learning that you have. Um, so I guess my question is, uh, how do you plan to make this or push this out or, or make the learning that you've captured here um, more accessible to other people? So that's a good question. Um, initially, when I was talking about balancing website design, you know, I, I talked about scope. And I never really expect this to reach a large scale scope. Like I never really, like, while I hope, you know, I, I, I just put this out there to say, hey, if you do need information on it, you know, you, you can find it here. But I, as for pushing it out, I don't think I really will per se, you know, um, I will pass it on to people. Oh, you know, they, they want to learn more about the, oh, refer to my website, icyclopedia.org. But I don't think I, I will push it out per se. Um, and like I said, applying to optometry school, you know, I think this will be a good uh, base for me, you know, for them to say, okay, like, look, this is what he knows, like I, like I previously said, and I learned so much about ailments and treatments that I, that I haven't previously known, even the history and uh, how these illusions work really, like, blew my mind, so. so yeah, I, it, I think, um, I think linking this to, um, you know, a portfolio or to a, a digital resume, um, a virtual resume or something, um, you know, would, would be amazing. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was Thanks. fantastic. And I think not only the learning for the content, but the learning of the website design. Um, I'm assuming you haven't put together a website of this scope before. Never, yeah, never. That's, that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, so Frank, a fabulous presentation, fa fabulous project. Uh, I, 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 I I, would, I think you way exceeded what, you know, when we talked about it at the beginning of the semester, way exceeded what I would have thought you could do, but. I didn't think I had enough. Oh my God, I've been so nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, you have exceeded expectations as they, as they say on the, on the back of awesome. <laughs> um, So what I, we, we really, we're really out of time. So I, I, I don't have, I, I don't have any questions anyway. I mean, you, it's what you, your presentation was beautifully clear. Um, but so are you, how did you do this? I mean, have you, are you a programmer? I, I am not a programmer. No, I'm not going to, I, I used WordPress. Um, it made it pretty simple. You know, it, it, I, I studied C++ while I was here, you know, and, and a little bit of Python and you don't really build a website using C++ and Python. It's all HTML. So um, some aspects I did incorporate, you know, I, I like the, the map I showed, you know, I, I needed to incorporate some layer of HTML coding and CSS styling. You know, you, you see the fonts a little bigger and the colors are a little different um, and all like that and, uh, required me to do some research into HTML and kind of figure out uh, some some aspects of coding, like clicking on the, the pictures even that, that, that requires some aspect of HTML coding and WordPress makes it really easy to where you can uh, edit individual sections with your own HTML. And that's that's kind of how I incorporated a bit wow. of HTML coding. So I am familiar with WordPress, but I, I'm blown away that you can you, you can do something like this uh, based on WordPress plus a little bit of programming. OK, um, like I say, we're way out of time. So um, it was a fabulous presentation. I, I, I want to congratulate all three of you on uh, one more great session. Uh, we're used to saying that now, uh, Meg and I, but uh, you, you, you know, the, the students in this course do fabulous work, I gotta say. And it, it's always a, a great pleasure to, to listen to you uh, talk, talk about your projects. Um, so I should say that now, before you're quite done, you, you, you're gonna have to hand in two papers and you know all about that, I imagine. And we'll, uh, we'll look forward to reading uh, in, in written form what you've just presented uh, on uh, towards the end of the semester. So congratulations again. And if you are graduating, which I think most people are, uh, lots of luck in, 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 uh, after you leave RIT, uh, I, I hope, uh, this course has been a, a, a good culmination to your studies and uh, and that uh, all the best for, for your future. Meg? Yeah, best of luck. Um, hang in there for these uh, last two crunch weeks and um, stay safe. We're really proud of these projects. So fantastic job. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Take care, everybody.